Hello and welcome to the program. My special guest today is Robert Alvarez, a senior scholar at the Institute for Policy Studies, where he's currently focused on nuclear disarmament, environmental and energy policies. Between 1993 and 1999, Mr. Alvarez served as a senior policy advisor to the Secretary and Deputy Assistant Secretary for National Security and the Environment. While at the Department of Energy, he coordinated the effort to enact nuclear worker compensation legislation. He coordinated nuclear material strategic planning for the department and established the department's first asset management program. Bob was awarded two secretarial gold medals, the highest awards given by the department. Bob Alvarez is an award-winning author and has published articles in prominent publications such as Science Magazine, The Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, Technology Review and The Washington Post. He joins me now from America. Welcome to If You Love This Planet, Bob. Good morning. Good morning. Good afternoon to you. We're taping in right. Australia <laughs> and you're in Washington, D.C. That's right. Um, the reason I wanted to specifically interview you now is to go through uh, in a logical sequence and explain to the public your paper on spent fuel storage. And we'll have to start right from the beginning. Um, what is spent fuel? Spent fuel uh, is, are the, the, the rods that are used in nuclear power plants to generate heat, uh, and the heat is generated by splitting the atoms of uh, uranium-235, uh, which is uh, in a uh, 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 mixture with uranium-238 in a percentage of around 3, 4, maybe 5 percent these days. And uh, after a period of a uh, year and a half or so, uh, the uh, uh, the fuel builds up radioactivity, and the ability of the uh, of the atoms of uranium-235 to split diminishes, and the fuel is is spent. The uranium-235 is spent, and in the course of doing that, it has um, uh, generated a fantastic amount of radiation. These fuel rods are uh, about oh, I would say roughly six to maybe seven, eight feet long. They're about as thick as uh, perhaps your thumb. And they are encased in a metal tube uh, uh, cladding that's made of, a, of, of a, uh, uh, an alloy of zirconium and stainless steel. Uh, these rods are then placed in the bundles, and the bundles tend to be in bunches of, let's say, 80 to 100. And uh, when they, uh, the fuel is used up, they pull these bundles out and they place them in uh, pools of water that are located near the reactor uh, where they're supposed to be cooled off. Uh, and the original intention was for the, the spent fuel to be put into these pools. And after five years, when uh, uh, some of the the more radioactive elements would have decayed and becomes uh, less hot both radioactively and thermally, uh, the spent fuel was to be moved elsewhere. Uh, but that has not been the case in the United States. These spent fuel rods uh, in a typical spent fuel pool uh, constitute some of the largest concentrations of radioactivity in the planet. Uh, some the reactors in the United States have been operating for several decades uh, and are, have uh, two or three reactors at a site that have been operating for 30 or 40 years. And these reactors have generated literally uh, uh, several hundred uh, millions of curies of radioactivity. There, there, aren't, uh, there aren't any concentrations like that that... Uh, that uh, exists other than at, uh, at uh, long, long operating nuclear power plants. Yeah, um, I, I've read that in America where, as you've just pointed out, the reactors have been going some for 40 years, that in some of the spent fuel pools um, there's two to 
30 times more radiation in the spent fuel pools than there is in the reactor itself. Would that be accurate? That's correct. And it has uh, a much more long-lived radioactivity than would be in a reactor. Uh, you would uh, typically a spent fuel pool would have uh, roughly five, six, seven times more long-lived radioactivity, most notably cesium-137, than you would have in a reactor. Yeah. Um, so just to give a background, when you put 100 tons or so of uranium in a reactor core, which is usually about the amount they use, the uranium, when it fissions, becomes 1 billion times more radioactive. 1 billion times more radioactive. And the core itself contains as much long-lived radiation as that released by the explosion of a thousand Hiroshima-sized bombs. So it's very, very radioactive. Describe just one spent fuel rod, which is about half an inch wide and, you know, six to 12 feet long, Bob. If you stand next to it, what would happen to you as a human well, being? Well, if you were to stand next to it for any period of time, uh, you know, a minute or so, you would uh, die from acute radiation syndrome. Well, how, how much time would you need to stand next to it for before you got that? Minutes. Minutes. If that. I so mean, much for, gamma for, radiation like x -rays. Yeah, if you, would, if, if you would take a uh, bundle of rods, for yeah. example, and, and put them outside, which is really inconceivable, but, uh, and you were to uh, ride on a motorcycle and drive uh, uh, within one foot of those rods at 60 miles per hour, uh, the, the time that you would, you would spend passing by at one foot at 60 miles an hour would be, would be enough to uh, kill you outright immediately. What, you just dropped dead off the motorbike? Yep. Oh, my God, I didn't know that. That's how, I mean, that's how fantastically radioactive this material is. You know, is. that would make a good film. Someone should make a film about all of this. Uh, well. <laughs> Do you know anyone in Hollywood? Uh, yes, but, <laughs> with special effects in the studios. Uh, well, I mean, this is realistic. That, but, I mean, it is, it, it, it is, this stuff is phenomenally radioactive. Oh. And, it has to be, and so it has, this is why it has to be kept in heavily shielded environments. Uh, and uh, they're, they're stored in the United States. Most of the spent fuel, about 75% of it that's been generated over these decades, are stored in these pools that are holding about four to five times more spent fuel than their original designs intended. These pools were never intended to be indefinite storage facilities for this ever-accumulating amount of uh, radioactive material. And where are the pools located um, in regards to the reactor itself? Well, for the uh, reactors that are similar to that of the of the Fukushima reactors, which you know experienced this terrible uh, disaster, uh, there are General Electric boiling water Mark One uh, reactors. Uh, the General Electric boiling water Mark One and Mark Two reactors have pools that are next to the reactors and are about a hundred feet off the ground. They're next so, to them. I thought they were on top of them, on top of the building. That no, they're off. They're off. The, they're off to the side. Oh, to the and side in a separate building. Uh, no, they're they're in the basically in the same reactor yeah. building. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but in order to refuel a boiling water reactor, you sort of have to pop off the top, pull the fuel out, and shift it over by an overhead crane, crane. into the nearby pool. Yeah, so, uh, so they're so, sort of on the roof. What, what, what about other pools? Are some of them on well, the ground? Well, the pressurized water reactors are either are located nearby the reactors, but they tend to be either uh, uh, on grade or slightly below grade, but they have cavities beneath them, uh, large um, spaces beneath them, which is problematic. The reason I'm mentioning the problem of the height of the pools and the issue of the cavities is that uh, it is the concern of what might happen if water were to drain. And uh, well, first of all, explain why water is necessary. Water is necessary to provide both cooling and shielding. So, uh, so these cool these spent fuel pools 
need to be continually cooled, as does the reactor core itself, right? With That's water. right. They have to they have to have water circulating through them on a constant basis. Yeah. Uh, they don't they don't get as hot as fast as the uh, uh, material inside of a reactor does. But over time, um, if you lose the coolant, uh, you'll, some very very um, uh, bad things can happen. In 2003, uh, my colleagues and I wrote a paper. Uh, because of our concern over the 9-11 the attack. And uh, we looked at what might happen if uh, terrorists were to uh, use the nuclear power plant as a target and what would be the most vulnerable aspect of the reactor. And we, we decided it was the spent fuel pools because the pools, unlike the reactors themselves, are not under any heavy, uh, thick-walled, uh, you know, concrete containment. Uh, they tend to be housed in what they call the reactor building and are housed in structures that you would find at auto dealerships or big box stores. So, uh, and then the pools that are high up above ground, if you think about it, if something were to cause a crack in the pool uh, and the water would drain all that much faster. Do you think terrorists uh, are aware of the vulnerability of these pools, Bob Alvarez? I think so. I think so. I mean, I, I think that uh, uh, that uh, there's enough information out in the public record that uh, this is not uh, some some big secret I'm giving away. And, uh, and is, is, isn't it true that the terrorists who flew into the World Trade Towers had in fact targeted the two Indian Point nuclear power plants 35 miles from Manhattan? Is that so, they had certainly considered doing that, and uh, uh, but chose not to. Uh, and and do those the, reactors have cooling pools on the on the uh, on the roof of the building? Elevated? No, they don't. They don't have elevated pools. But wh what we pointed out was that um, if something or somebody, because uh, uh, things the. One of the worst possible things could happen to a, a reactor is, for example, an earthquake. Yeah. Uh, because it, 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 it causes, you know, essentially uh, destruction of, of lots of things that are necessary uh, to, to keep uh, the reactor uh, in a safe mode. And so if someone were to crash a plane or an earthquake were to occur and cause the, the water to drain from the pool, what would happen is that over time, the by the time the water these these pools are 40 to 50 feet deep. The walls are fairly thick, uh, but they can be penetrated by uh, anti-tank weapons, aircraft, and things like that. Uh, or earthquakes can cause them to crack. Mm. Um, when the water drains, uh, by the time the water reaches approximately, let's say, one meter above the top of the spent fuel, the radiation doses coming off of the, the spent fuel assemblies uh, would be life-threatening to people at the site. Isn't that uh, what happened in Fukushima? Well, uh, that's, the, that's the, certainly what happened at Fukushima. Uh, in and four they, fuel pools? Four fuel pools? Well, they had, they had pools where, where they are obviously, the dose rates, that were coming off of the pools were so great that they couldn't go near these these buildings and had to use remote water cannons and uh, helicopters and the like to try to dump water and then to keep them from... And, uh, and uh, isn't that still the case? They haven't really fixed the fuel pools and they're still emanating... Well, what they have huge... done is that they've been able to establish a little more stable supply of water, but it's not a closed system. It's still an ad hoc system. Uh, and subject to lots of leaks and the things such as the pools themselves, uh, you have to be concerned about their integrity after the earthquake and the tsunami and whether or not they have cracks in them or any other disturbances can cause mm. them to, to leak further. Mm. So as, we, as the water drains, and by, by the time the water uh, is drained enough that the, the, the fuel itself is exposed to open air, 
Uh, it varies in time, but it could be a matter of hours.